Welcome everyone, thank you for joining us. I'm Jeremy Tiang, a writer and translator from Chinese and a member of the translation collective Sadilla and Company. We're delighted to be collaborating with the Centre for Fiction to bring you this monthly series and are grateful for the Centre's support. These translation clinics are intended as knowledge sharing open sessions for practitioners and readers of literary translation from all backgrounds and experience levels. Each month, we invite a different literary translator to discuss a subject of their choice with a Sadilla member, followed by a Q&A with attendees. Topics range from questions and theories of craft to submissions, contracts, and other practical concerns, all this with an eye to literary translation as a profession. Attendees are encouraged to bring questions from their own practice. These sessions will be recorded and available for later viewing and live captioning is available. You can click on the CC button on the bottom menu for various options. Also feel free to add comments and questions in the chat, which tonight will be moderated by Sedilla member Alex Zucker, a translator from Czech. In the second half of the session, we'll open up the conversation for audience questions. Today, we're delighted to have with us Madhu Kaza, a writer, translator, artist and educator based in New York City. She's a translator of the feminist Telugu writers Volga and Vimala, and she recently edited Kitchen Table Translations, a volume that explores the connections between migration and translation and which features immigrant, diasporic and POC translators. She was the founding director of the Bard Micro College at Brooklyn Public Library and currently serves as faculty advisor to the program. She also teaches in the MFA program at Columbia University. In this session, we'll be talking about translation as a form of creative writing and the ways original writing and literary translation can mutually inform creative practice. Madhu, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, to start with, Perhaps you could share with us something about the contours of your writing and creative life and the space that literary translation occupies within that. Um, well, first of all, I'm so excited, Jeremy, to be in conversation with you. Um, and um, I think in terms of thinking about creative practice, actually, I'll mention one thing that's actually not so, super relevant to um, this conversation, but um, my creative practice also includes um, from a background in performance art. Um, um, but in terms of writing, um, I'll say that for me, you know, I did not um, in any way train as a translator. Um, you know, I have a background in literature. Um, I am a writer um, of prose. But um, translation is something that kind of um, like many, many people, I think I kind of fell into it, um, but the falling took a long time. Um, it, was, it was a decade of um, enter, you know, falling into, into an abyss, I guess, of translation. But, um, but um, I think, you know, one of the things I'm hoping that we get to talk about is really the ways in which um, all creative practice kind of, you know, it can be part of a larger kind of holistic, you know, practice. Um, and certainly um, the translation feels to me like a creative practice. Um, and I just wanna say one other thing uh, before we get into like serious deep conversation is that um, the um, title for today's event um, that I saw was how, I think it's like how we can create, treat translation as creative writing. And I, it, I think it might even have been me who suggested that title or something like that. And it really strikes me, it almost strikes me as like a, like a, a title that comes through translation. Like there's something a little, um, the idea, how, how do we treat translation as creative writing? <laughs> um, it has a strange, slightly off um, like sound to me. Um, and I think that, um, but I enjoy that. I think it's really, it's really interesting. And I think that that's part of the like enjoyment yeah, I think both with um, original writing and with translation, it's, you know, um, very much about um, the enjoyment of language. Yeah, I, I mean, you've written about how um, literary translation is often assessed in this country in terms of smoothness or seamlessness and pushing back against that. And I think the same can be true of original writing. We can enjoy things that are slightly awkward or a bit bumpy 
Um, I also love your idea of falling into literary translation, but it being a slow fall, because that conjures up this kind of Alice in Wonderland, gradual, gradual sinking, where gravity doesn't quite operate and you have adventures along the way, um, and maybe never quite reach a destination. Maybe the fall itself is literary translation. I did not expect the metaphor to take this turn when I started the sentence, but there you go. <laughs> and I also want to say that um, I too have absolutely no training in writing or translation um, and also came to this from a performance background. Um, in fact, I have a master's in acting and was an actor before I too had a slow long fall into this. Um, and I do hope we get to talk um, about performance and translation or translation as performance um, later on. Um, but I also wanted to ask you about the idea of encounter. And, and we've spoken about how both writing and translation are forms of encounter, but are there differences in the quality of these encounters, do you think? So I, I love that question, because I think, um, I think it's most obvious when one is doing translation that you are encountering another, right? You're encountering another language, you're encountering um, a particular voice and sensibility in this, an author and in the text, um, a particular narrative. Um, and so much you know, of then the translation work is this relational kind of experience of working through um, you know, that um, with uh, the other writer and text. Um, but I think that, I think what's interesting to me is I think that all writing has that quality um, of, or all writing can have that quality of um, encounter. And I think that's partly, you know, in thinking about like, what does translation, what does doing translation give to a writer? I think it gives, um, there's so many things that I think that you know, doing translation um, can offer for someone who's a writer, um, whether or not they just you know, publish literary translations. Um, and I think that um, really there's something about translation, you know, you're always dealing with something that's, that's outside of yourself. Right? And I think that there's some, an aspect of original writing too um, that can really benefit from that little bit of distance. So even if you're writing about your own self, um, I mean, you, you might not be writing about your own self, but uh, even when you're writing about your own self, um, you know, this notion of self-expression, I think there's something about the experience of translation, uh, of thinking about um, just getting like one step outside of yourself, which I think is, is necessary in terms of thinking about what you're doing with language, again, and rhythm, and you know, your voice um, as a writer. So I think, um, you know, I think um, it's, it's part of my own thinking. I actually teach a class called Writing as Encounter. And, um, and it's very much, it's not a translation class. It's very much about this. Um, and, about, and, it, and it actually has some philosophical kind of um, underpinnings in, in like uh, in Simone Weil and Martin Buber and you know, some different thinkers. But, um, but, it, but thinking about how whenever you're writing about something, um, what does it mean to be writing not just about a thing, but writing with a thing, you know, writing with your characters, uh, with a place that you're kind of describing. Um, and so I think that, you know, and I think translation uh, is a, you know, I, I think we tend to think of it as like translation, you're always dealing with something that's other than you. And then um, maybe your original writing is just like the maybe outpouring of a self. But I think that actually um, the way that you encounter your own voice, your own self um, can be really um, important to consider. Um, I'm curious if you have thoughts about that. Um, I, I think similarly, I, I also experienced both writing and literary translation as, as relational. Um, and I very much, um, what you said about stepping outside of the self in order to write, taking one step um, apart, um, resonated. I, I think because um, I perhaps think of myself as not as self, but as having selves. Um, and perhaps many of us who have had the experience of um, multiple cultures and language 
languages, whether this is through immigration or colonialism, um, will have selves that aren't quite congruent. Um, and sometimes it feels like you're stepping not so much outside the self as from one self to another or between selves and writing about that intersection. Um, so I, I guess what I'm saying is that even when I'm doing original writing, I always feel like I'm translating some aspect of myself, not necessarily for someone else, maybe for another aspect of myself. Um, yeah, I hadn't really thought about this before, but I think a lot of my writing practice is me explaining things to myself. Um, I love what you just said though about the multiple selves, because I, I feel the same. And I think that, um, and I don't think you have to have multiple languages to feel that you have, you know, that the self is not coherent and unitary. Um, but I do think that when you do have multiple languages, um, there are different, uh, not only parts of identity that are available to you, but there's also different ways of um, structuring language and thinking. Um, and so I definitely think about that also. And um, the way that you, um, you know, I think what you're also um, bringing up is even, even within English, there, because there's so many Englishes, you know, yeah. that that can be the case as well. Yeah. I, I also love what you said about um, writing with rather than writing about. Um, and I wonder whether we could also think about rather than translating from, translating with, not from a language, not translating a book, but translating with another author, translating with another text, um, that kind of hand in hand relationship. Um, is, is that something that you feel, I, I guess, what's the relationship with the authors you translate or the texts you work with? So I, um... I mean, there are a number of people here who are uh, very experienced translators, and I think that um, I think what I would say from my from my own experience, um, as someone who translates writers who are uh, contemporary and alive, um, you know, I think that that it it shapes um, the way that I think about. Um, a text because I'm not only dealing with a text, but also there is actually input sometimes from an author, a living author. Um, and I think that, that that is very likely quite different if you're working with um, you know, um, a kind of much older text. Um, but I think that the feeling of uh, working with, I mean, the thing about when I, when I think about relation, um, I also think about the fact that um, that doesn't mean that there aren't difficulties, right? Like, it doesn't mean that you, um, like, uh, to write with another uh, author, you know, to kind of co-create um, something, which is, I think, what translation can be. Um, it's interesting, actually, there's, in India, um, I've come across a number of uh, Indian translators and theorists who have this notion of um, translation as transcreation. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and um, and it's I, that way of thinking. I've just seen it much more in an in Indian or South Asian context. Um, and I think so. I mean, that gets back right to this point of you know the translation being a creative endeavor, um, but where you're holding from you're holding this text uh, with someone else, right? And so there's a kind of negotiation. Um, it's, it's not, um, because translation is hard, there is a um, uh, really sometimes, um, in some ways maybe what, what I'm actually just, what's occurring to me now is that sometimes it, um, translation then becomes triangulation also, right? Because there's the other, if you're working with a living um, author, there is um, that voice um, and then a text that they've made, maybe even, it goes four ways, right? Then there's like the text that you're going to make. And so it's like, um, I think that like to me, I think there's something about, um, just as what you said about there not being a sin, like a single self, thinking out, even outside of binaries, right? Um, yeah. I think about, you know, the pluralities um, that exist both within, within a particular text and the possible um, continued circulation of a text, even after it's like, so your translation might not be the end all be all also, right? Yeah, 
No, and I think that that does take the pressure off. Um, as with writing, not thinking of the final product as in any way definitive or representative of anything more than this moment in time, um, this particular encounter. Um, I think that, you know, Jeremy, just when you were talking, what also occurs to me is I think that's another way in which translation work can free up creative writing. Because yeah. we do think of our own, of like original language writing as like, it's going, it's going to be a product and it's going to be fixed. It's going to be settled. Right. And that's where like being immersed in translation, you can see how things continue to, um, you know, the text continues to have a life, right? an afterlife. It continues to circulate. There's ways in which you can keep um, the thinking active around the text um, as opposed to kind of just being focused on like one single kind of endpoint. Yeah, I, I was talking to a Japanese translator once and, and she said, um, that she liked to think of herself as a baker. You don't bake bread for posterity, you bake bread to feed people today. Um, and I think that view of translation is very liberating. I love what you said earlier about just because that's a relationship doesn't mean it's not difficult. And I think in some ways it's when there is a relationship that it becomes most fraught and most difficult. Um, the relationship itself can be a stumbling block. Um, and actually, I would like to read, if I may, a brief sentence from Kitchen Table Translations, um, your introduction, which um, also everyone should go out and get Kitchen Table Translations. I recommend it. Um, uh, you say um, in your interview with Katrina Dodson, who happily is also on this call, um, because Telugu is so important to me and the language already signals a kind of loss in my life, working with it is very fraught. Every attempt at translation from Telugu feels like a repetition of the difficult experience of immigration. Is that still something you feel today? You know, yes and no. I think that, um... What, like do, working on translation has really opened um, my world and um, made me f um, both, you know, like we often hear uh, people talk about um, people who are immigrants or who are diasporic, you know, this question of do I belong here or do I belong there? Or am I this or am I that? And actually working on translation has, um, really opened up space for me not to be thinking in, in those ways and to be like, yes, and, you know, both and. Um, but I think that what's interesting is that the ways in which it is still really fraught is that the translation um, world is also very asymmetrical, right? Like in terms of literary translation into, the, in, into English in the US, um, there is like, uh, for those people who don't know, you know, that, like in terms of, um, these like literally in terms of immigration, there's this, you know, each country gets a certain number of visa, visas per year and allotment, the number of immigrants um, who will be admitted into the country. And I know for, for many nations, um, you know, people wait for years and years and years and, you know, to be able to get their um, visa to enter into the United States. Um, and it's a long process, but those quotas, those numbers are different for different countries, right? And there's a kind of imbalance um, in, 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 in those numbers. And it's actually quite similar, I think, in translation um, in terms of uh, what gets permitted, what, it's like what gets through the gates to get published in the US um, in English translation. And so, so those, those same issues still come up because of the hurdles of publishing, um, but not in some deep identitary. I had never thought about the echoes of um, US immigration policy and the literary translation world, but when you put it like that, it does make perfect sense. Um, I myself, I think, probably benefited from Singapore being a tiny country with a relatively high um, quota for visas. But in the translation world, um, I mostly have to translate texts from mainland China, um, these being more in demand. Um, China being a country more people have heard of. 
But yeah, I, I guess we navigate these contours of our divided selves, of our languages, um, not just languages in the sense of different languages, but all our Englishes, all our Telugu's and so forth. Um, and for me, certainly, literary translation is one of the few things that brings all these fragmented um, aspects together. Um, do, do you feel that, that there is a unifying um, dimension to literary translation um, in its, I guess, its hybridity, the way it's about transformation? The reason why I'm, I'm pausing is I don't know if unifying is actually the right, right. Uh, word for me. Um, I mm -hmm. think, so I think the thing that's interesting to me is that um, I actually feel sometimes that translation doesn't result, like doesn't actually unify anything. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, it shows me um, there, there are places where two languages can kind of cross over and then there are places where like they just like, you know, when you're trying to force um, a puzzle piece uh, into the puzzle, but it's not the right one, but you keep jamming it in. And I feel like um, in any translation work, I do feel that there are these pieces like that, that things that just don't fit. And, but what I, but I also don't think that that's um, a, uh, cause for, I don't think that's a, a great tragedy, I guess, you know? Um, so I think that it's, so in more than it unifying um, to cultures, to languages, or even to practices, right? Um, of like writing and, and friends and everything, I feel like um, it allows, I, I think it's just a fun, what translation gives me is it gives me a space where I can put things together, allow them to fit in whatever way they're going to fit, including sometimes um, not so coherently together, um, yeah. and and then just let and to let that be, and also to let that be a value, to say that's actually something I value, and to me um, that's you know when I when I think about how important literature and translation is to me, so there's translation practice, but I think you know I also do translation in part because literature and translation has been so meaningful to me. Like reading um, works, uh, you know, since I was uh, very young, reading works in translation, where I wasn't really paying attention to translation, but I think it's because it's like, it shows you ways, um, reading works from other languages, other cultures shows you ways of um, looking at the world or looking at experience that aren't exactly what's already available to you. Um, like even as a writer, right? Um, there are ways, if you know, if you read a lot of literature and translation, there's uh, you know, ways of writing that are available to you that aren't if you're only reading Anglo-American fiction, let's say. Right? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I, I probably didn't mean unifying. Um, I think you're absolutely right that it is a way of being aware of these differences, of being aware of this breadth of experience and voices that are out there. Um, and at a personal level, I think maybe for me, it doesn't unify, but it makes me better understand how the bits of myself don't quite fit together and um, helps me be comfortable with that. Um, on which note, we've reached the halfway mark. So we are going to open this up to audience questions. Um, if you're comfortable with it, we invite you to turn your camera on, no pressure. Um, and if you wish to speak on screen, raise your hand either by clicking at the bottom of the participants list or by using the reactions button. And you'll be invited to unmute your microphone and ask the question yourself. If you prefer for your question to be read out, um, please send it privately to Sedilla Alex Zucker um, in the chat and he will read it out. We will try to get to all the questions, but I see there's already a number of chats, so we may not, um, in which case, apologies. Um, we'll do our best. Um, do we have any immediate questions? Alex, are there questions in the chat or is anyone raising their hand? 
There is a question from Jeffrey. I can go ahead and read that. Um, considering that translation can often be thought of as a form of constrained writing, I'm wondering if there's been a moment in one of Madhu's translations when she's felt like she could fly free. Um, I love that question because I feel like people don't ask that about translation, right? It's always like the constraint, the constraint, the constraint. I'm like, what is the freedom in, in translation? Um, and I think that um, It's, I think it's a negotiation. I think it's back and forth. Like sometimes I, I, it's like you have those, it's, it's like, to me, it's very much like um, writing, doing original language writing where you have moments when you like, okay, I'm gonna try this, I'm gonna try this move, you know? And then you try something and it's like, it's wild and it's exciting. And then later on you're like, okay, that, that didn't work. <laughs> you know, so I think translation is full of those kinds of moments, but those are wonderful moments because again, if you're gonna, I think, when you, if you're going to do anything um, that's not super literal translation, you have to give yourself that freedom. Um, I think for me, the other ask, ask thing that comes up in response to that question is I actually, what's interesting to me is that, you know, we think of writing, um, working on translation, making a translation, we think of that as constraint, right? Because you have an original text and you have a responsibility to that original text. And it's like you have multiple responsibilities to that original text and to a reader in the language that you're translating into, right? And um, so that we think of it as constraint, you know, like what can I do with from this language into you know to English? I actually think that even when you're just writing, let's say, fiction or nonfiction in original language in English, you're also constrained. Um, but you don't always think, realize you're constrained because like, let's say English is so internalized, like this, like the rules of English, um, both like syntactically, like how English works. Um, you know, um, I was joking to, with my students about um, like some words that I've recently discovered that I'm like uh, super excited about. Um, I'm gonna actually put it into the chat, this word that I told my students about that I just love. Ultramontane, okay. It's because you just think, oh my God, it's like you think of like the French philosophy, like writer, you're like, it's ultramontane, ultramontane. It just sounds like a great word. You're like, I really, really want to use this word. It just got so much life in it. But ultramontane apparently means um, someone like to, to believe in supreme like hierarchy of the Pope. I'm not going to find a way to use that word um, in my, I'm going to try. But I'm not going to be able to. I'm definitely not going to be able to uh, work that into my novel. Um, and so it's like we are constrained, even when we're writing, you know, in our like your own novel, when you're writing your own essay, you can't just do whatever you want, right? Um, and I think we forget that because um, so much of that is so already ingrained in us in terms of even just thinking about style and rhythm, like how sentences work. Um, we we are constrained. And so I think with both the translation and with original language writing, it's like playing between like the constraints and then not do them. So I love that question. That's going to be a spike in the Google results for Ultramontane and no one's going to know why. Um, Lola has a hand up. Um, yeah, I was uh, thinking about uh, that idea of freedom in translation and you were talking earlier about uh, working with the author and how that can add a layer of difficulty. But I've also had the experience where by working with the author, um, it somehow gives me permission to be more free in my translation because the author has given me that permission. And when I don't work directly with the author, I'll feel more constrained uh, because I haven't like been given explicit uh, permission to, to, you know, uh, use my own like parallel, but not direct uh, translated ideas and so on. And I was wondering uh, whether that's been true for you and if you had any experiences like that, that you could, you could think of. Um, for me, I think um, 
I think it really just it right. It really depends on and the writer because I think that that permission that you're describing, um, Lola, I think that that's amazing, right? And someone who says, you know, I trust you. I think one of the challenges translating from Telugu to English is that um, you know English is also an Indian language, and um, there is, I mean, including the fact that there's English in Telugu at this point, um, but so. Most, like the writers that I have translated um, know English well, um, you know, and so it's, I think it's really different if it's like someone who, um, there's a way in which English circulates in their, in their cult in, in India, right? And so I think that um, one of the negotiate, like one of the difficulties has been for me, it's like, the, like um, it has to do with which English am I translating into? And so that's where sometimes it's been a little tricky for me because um, the, like the English of my author um, might be really like the idiomatic kind of you know, thinking there is maybe different than the way that I would translate into a more American idiom. Right, it's a localization issue. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder too, if in creative writing that uh, you know, we could think of ourselves as our own author and translator and be the author that gives ourselves permission to be free in translating whatever our inner creativity has given us. <laughs> Thank you for the question, Lola. Um, Lucia has a hand up. Um, Alex, could you yes. unmute? Hi. Yes. My name is Lucia. Uh, thank you so much for this session. Um, I completely agree on what you mentioned about the passport power and uh, visibility in the kind of literature in publication. Uh, I myself don't come from any literature background or writing background whatsoever. I come from like more art, uh, media art background, and lately I became uh, more interested in yoga and mindfulness. And I noticed that uh, even I'm back. I'm from Korea, and even in a Korean publishing market, I noticed that many books. Although yoga comes from India, many books on yoga come from like, you know, white authors. And I kind of, I found a more and more interesting topics on kind of intersectionality in the spiritual world where like, you know, they talk about decolonization of yoga. And uh, those texts I found them interesting, but in my own culture, like I don't see that happening. So that's like what kind of got me more interested in like translation, mm -hmm. because I kind of want to be that kind of bridge between, hey, this is what's going on in the world here, but I don't, I don't want my people to be left out about it and then still be in that kind of world of, you know, just like going by what's written, uh, you know, that's anyway, and, and that's um, more from the major, you know, major, like Western, like, uh, you know, limited kind of source uh, I know, in the authors. But anyway, uh, my question is, how does one a person like me, who doesn't come from writing or literature background, but come from our, back, uh, our background, and I am, I mean, my mother tongue is Korean, and I, but I, you know, I write in English and Korean. Uh, how, what would be the like the first step, like easier step for someone like me to get into a trend, the world of translation and publication? Um, so thank you um, for your comment as well as for your question. I just, because you, because your comment is actually uh, relevant to something like I, I you know, the, you comment about um, spiritual traditions and across cultures. It just so happens today, I was reading a text. Um, this is for a moment, this um, my little parenthetical that's not about literary translation, but it, it's connected. Um, I was reading a text, I'm reading a text. Um, I'm reading some text about um, how Buddhism was um, moved from India through Southeast Asia to China, really to um, India to China, and then subsequently you know, China to Korea, Japan. And, but the, the process of um, translating a culture, a system of beliefs, um, and then actually literal translation is, is, is kind of fascinating to me, um, what that translation process was like. And the, the piece that I was reading today actually has to do with Western, uh, Western Buddhists, at the, the term is cultural rearticulation and racial rearticulation of um, spiritual traditions and how those things get translated um, you know, from East Asia to, um, to the West. So just to say, there's, um, 
it's, it's just interesting to me that you um, brought that up because I've been thinking about it. Um, but you know, in terms of your question about translation and how to get into it if you're not a literary translator, um, I feel like I love to encourage people um, to play with translation, to try it, um, if you have access to languages. And I think that one really, um, um, really fun way to begin uh, translation is to do it collectively with people. Um, because, you know, you can, um, just to give an example, when I, uh, for a few years, I uh, worked in uh, Myanmar and um, I don't have any Burmese, but I would gather, we would gather, me and my American colleagues would gather with a couple of poets um, and we would all go to like the tea shop, you know, hanging out outside. And it'd be just like, a, um, kind of like a round robin where like we would get some Burmese poems and together collectively with some people who are Burmese, some people who only had English, we would just sit and like work on a poem together, you know? And so, and, and so much of that was in dialogue, like talking about like, what does this word mean? And like going back and forth. And so I think um, there are many ways to play with translation, even if you're not ready to like sit down and tackle a book like manuscript or, you know, um, you know, I, I think translation, just to say also that I think that um, in the same way that becoming a writer is a long, like there's a long trajectory, right? So years and years and years of um, writing, reading and writing. I think trans like to become a good translator um, takes a long time. So it's a practice, you know, but that doesn't mean um, that one can't um, do it. And also it doesn't mean that, that if you don't have the aspiration to, to commit um, to you know, book length translations or like literary translations, doesn't, I, I think it's a wonderful practice uh, creative practice um, just to kind of play with it. And I think that's one one way. I want to echo what you said, Matthew, Thank about, you. about um, doing it collectively, um, because that is the origin story of Sadilla and Company. Um, we formed a translation collective, um, not, not to translate collectively because we all work in different languages, um, but to be translators collectively, to help each other figure out how this profession works, how the industry works, and to make our way forward in it. Um, because we know more together than individually, and our voices together are stronger than separately. So I think that is generally true, that, that writing and literary translation are both very isolating and, and are often carried out solitarily. But in fact, building these communities, whether they're formal collectives or just networks of friends on the same journey is, at least for us, has been hugely important. It's amazing. Thank you so much. We have a question in the chat from Deborah. What are your thoughts about the edges of responsibility in translation, for example, some of the modern translations of classics by Mary Jo Bang and Robert Pinsky and Maria Davana Headley go far afield. How to provide historical context for the reader to credit the original, or is that necessary at all? So I probably have a um, not super orthodox or not scholarly response to this. Um, you know, because again, I think for me, it's like I really value multiplicity. And um, I just, this question makes me think of, um, there was a period of time a couple of years ago where I was, um, a friend was trying to figure out which version, which version of the Inferno should she read? And you, know, you, you won't ever read any version of the Inferno if you, if you really think about which version, which translation of Homer, you know? It's like you can get really stuck for a long time trying to figure out which translation, right? And so we did this thing. It was like a um, couple of friends gathered and we read from like five translations together, um, including like, a, I think it was like a Mary Jo Bang was in there. Um, and, um, and it was so wonderful because, you know, I mean, we're talking about the Inferno. So again, it's a classical text. And to read, like we, and we actually, we read very slowly. We didn't, get too far into Inferno because um, we would read out loud, line by line across text. Um, it was so fun. It was such good training for the ear 
Um, it's such good training, I think, as, as a writer to be like listening to that language. Um, and it was actually, a, even though we were in Inferno, in Dante's Inferno, it really felt like a bomb, B-A-L-M, you know, and um, to hear that language. And, but I, I say this just because in terms of versions or, or different kinds of translations of classic, so I think it's really fun to read a very, uh, you know, much more scholarly version in relation, you know, in conversation with a more experimental uh, translation. Um, I think they lift out, you know, different aspects of the text. Um, and I think just knowing, I think it's just helpful to know that, um, you know, whatever markers there are on the text, you, know, you can you, know, you can tell a scholarly version of um, by who's publishing it and the footnotes and the essays at the front and whatever. But I actually, I think, I mean, it's a difficult thing to recommend to, I think, a lot of American readers because there's this notion that readers don't want, you know, challenges or whatever. But I think actually it's like, it's so fun to read multiple translations of a text, you know, at the same time. Um, even I think I'm thinking Katrina is here. So I'm thinking about the, um, not a text that uh, she translated, but the, um, the, oh my gosh, the posthumous, uh, there's a- Where is a Bras Cubas? Yeah. There's a <laughs> Thank you. There's like, a, you know, two translations of a book came out at the same time. And, you know, it's kind of, um, I mean, I'm sure it's nerve wracking for the actual, for the translators. But for us readers, I think it's just a cornucopia. You know? I love that idea of, of different translations not being in competition, but in conversation with each other. Um, I think we embrace that. It, it probably is how in this country translations are often seen as um, being a matter of skill rather than a matter of interpretation and hence evaluated along those lines. Um, oh, that's a question in the chat and Katrina has her hand up. As we were just talking to you, Katrina, why don't we go with your question and then we'll take the one in the chat. Sure, I had kind of a basic question and then Jeffrey asked his and then it, I felt like it, it torpedoed mine because it was um, so much more specific about, you know, the freedom or you, what did you say? Translations constrained writing. But I guess I just still wanted to express and I was hoping like some just like, I don't know, anxiety is such an overused word, but basically this whole idea of, of translations creative writing, which I wholly embrace. And I love Kate Briggs's um, phrase, writing translations that she talks about in this little art. But at the same time, you know, I always want to say, there, there's a part like I want to think more about, well, it's not all the same, you know, writing fiction or poetry. Or, you know, when I refer to, my translation, sometimes I slip and I say my book and then I correct as no, 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 my translation. And you did talk about a little bit like, you know, it's writing with another. So it's almost maybe it's like our book, but I guess um, I, yeah, I was curious to hear a little bit more about um, just different ways you inhabit that realm of creative writing as a translator versus as a as a writer and I know I mean this is a huge question but I think and and there's also I mean I'm more in, I'm interested in hearing more about you know the different ways that that translation translation is creative writing but um I think something that's that I've uh, also been thinking about is the ways that when you're writing especially on a subject that requires a kind of cultural translation or you're writing in English, but you're what you're talking about other languages, other cultures, there is all those questions of translation. How much do you gloss? Do you need to you know, do cultural translation? Can you leave um, words untranslated in the text? So this is kind of like a, like a ten, many tentacled question, but just want to throw some stuff out there. I think it's great. Um... So, so much to be said about this. Uh, I'm really curious, Jeremy, your thoughts. But um, what I'll say is just, I mean, I definitely, I think, I definitely don't think that, I think it's like, we, Jeremy and I were talking about like, having like a, a practice and then translation being part, like one aspect of that practice and, and then like creative writing, writing a novel, writing a play being another aspect of it, but not collapsing it into the same thing for sure. Um, and one of the things that Jeremy and I had talked about before the session was that, like, I know for me, it's like, 
Um, I don't do both practices at the same time. Um, like it's, it, I can't tra like um, tra be translating something and um, writing my own work, like working on my novel while I'm translating someone else's fiction, um, because like that person's voice and their their rhythms and you know whatever it is that they're doing is so kind of burrowed into my like brain that I can't I, I need like space to separate to like do my own work and I think so like I definitely think that there there's I think that the ways that they inform each other um, are complicated um, and I think that the thing with um, thinking about um, the I guess maybe, um, I mean, I don't know, there's so much more to, to you know, one could say, but I think, I, I think what's coming up um, to the forefront for me is a question around um, what, um, what, do, what does having done translation give to me as a writer? So it's not like a simultaneous thing, but that act of having translated Add something to my own work, and then and then the, being a writer, of course, um, you know, it's like you can't. Um, I think there's a there's a question in the chat about can you be a good translator and a bad writer? Um, <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Um, you know, you have to be a good like you have to like if you are translating, you are writing, right? And so, um, so I think that that that's pretty much a given. But in terms of um, in terms of you know, I, I think a lot of it is, for me, it's like a lot of it is very sensory. It's like thinking, like learning to pay a certain kind of attention to, um, you know, when you're, when you're translating, right? Like there's like this pressure when you're choosing words, right? You're, there's a pressure sometimes um, between choosing a word for its meaning, uh, its meaning in the original with all of its connotations. The word that you're choosing in English that meaning and all of its connotations and they'll kind of map the most precise meaning. But then you also have to deal with sound and like the sensory aspect of a word. And so you might have a word that maps um, really well, like, you know, matches, you know, the original language, you know, but it doesn't sound right in English or, you know, it sounds off. And so there's this, this pressure, you know, when you're translating, you have to pay, you're paying really close attention to the pressure points of language around sound and sense. Um, and I think that heightened awareness is something that I think you can take back into like, you know, like I think about, I think has made its way into my own writing, right? Um, that I'm, I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm looking at what are the options available to me, you know, um, in the sentence, what are the words and sometimes, and also just um, to say that about the, um, I think that even in original language writing, talking about the cultural um, translations, what to gloss, that if you are a non-mainstream writer, um, if you have cultural difference, that question comes up in your original language writing, right? Am I going, am I going to say, I ate a dosa, a savory crepe? No, or am I just gonna say, I ate a dosa, right? Um, Am I going to so so some of us are asked to translate even in our original language writing, right? And I think that you know um, I feel like Jeremy, you might have some things to say about this too. Yes, um, I'm also excited because that ties in with this question that we had in the chat from Emily Wan about how um, perhaps we translate for the self or to connect the selves, um, and whether we can expand on this personal dimension of translating as multilinguals. Um, and we had also before talked about how both writing and translation can be a way of mapping the self um, and, and kind of mapping ourselves perhaps onto this English language that both is and isn't ours. You know, I was thinking of, um, so I, I have a few students um, who are here and um, one of the things I'd ask my students to do in, in, a, in class the semester was to um, kind of map their themselves in the English language to locate themselves in, in 
on a number of different levels. So um, think about the ways that their English is inflected regionally, um, in terms of different dialects that they, that they have access to, um, their accents, um, the way that their language is gendered maybe, or you know, racialized. Um, so we just, we talked about a lot of different ways in which, um, and it could be around abilities, um, you know, and, and we talked to, and I asked students to do this, not because um, now you must write from that position that you've just described in terms of your English, but to, to, but to recognize that we, um, you know, there are so many Englishes around us, you know, and, um, and they're actually, it's so wonderful, like to have access to, to those. And, um, you know, even um, to think about, like for, for me, you know, I think about, uh, you know, I grew up in the mid, I, I was born in India, my early childhood was in India, I grew up in the Midwest. Um, I feel like my English is very much formed by that Midwestern kind of upbringing. Um, but I also have um, access to different Indian Englishes. Um, and it's, it, it, I just like, I really sometimes like, uh, miss being in India because the way that the language comes alive, you know, and it's, it, and, you know, Indian English is just, it's, it, um, I just, it, it feels so alive to me because I'm not swimming in it every day, you know, it's like, I'm not in it all the time. And I think that, um, I think about this in terms of my own writing. So I, you know, I think, um, I, I feel like Yoko um, Tawada said something like this um, last summer in, one of, in, in an event she did, but I definitely feel that, you know, when I write in my original language writing, my fiction, my um, nonfiction, I write in a fair, like, this is how I describe, actually recently to an editor, I described my writing like this. I want my prose to be mostly competent with occasional jags and awkwardness. And that's not a performative jag, um, but that sometimes it's a slight, like a slight an expression that to my in Indian English ear sounds right, but sounds a little awkward or off to you know, an American kind of ear uh, or one of the possible American English ears, right? Um, and so I think that that, you know, the thing that Yoko Tawada said is like, I want my, my writing to sound like as if it's in translation, you know, which is not what we generally, you know, aspire to, right? Um, so that's, you know, I think. Yeah, no, I, I feel that a lot, how the demand for smoothness often feels like the demand to slice off certain bits of ourselves that don't fit. Um, we have two minutes left, which is hopefully just enough time, Madhu, for you to answer the final question that we ask all our speakers, which is what would an ideal future of literary translation look like to you? Um, you know, I, it's so funny. I, I knew this question was coming and I forgot to think about it. Um, so I'll think about it now um, and say that I, I think that um, an ideal future of literary translation, from it, in my view, is one where there's a lot more going on, um, and uh, from a lot of different languages. Um, again, just yesterday in my in the class that I was teaching, um, I you know showed students. Um, there's a project uh, by um, Jalada Africa. Um, they have an issue of their their magazine uh, on translation, and they what they did was they took one story by Ngugi Watango, and they had it translated into ninety seven languages. Um, and so Ngugi wrote that um, story in Kikuyu, but they have the story translated into like you know dozens of African languages, um, Hausa, you know, um, Kiswahili, right, and Wala. And then, but also into like Nepali and, um, you know, like all the, my favorite was that it's translated into Shetlandic. Um, and that, and I was saying to my students yesterday, that to me is a translation utopia. Um, that it's not always about going through English. I mean, some of that obviously did go through English to get from maybe um, Kikuyu to Shetlandic or something. Um, but the, that, that kind of translation ecology where things are circulating in multiple ways and it's not always just um, the same languages that are, you know, kind of that the market favors. Um, 
So that kind of multiplicity, um, I think is my idea. That's great. I think this vision of a translation utopia is the perfect one to end on. Um, so I will say now thank you to everyone for joining us and thank you again to the Centre for Fiction for hosting these clinics and especially thank you Madhu for being with us tonight. These translation clinics take place on the third Thursday of every month. Please sign up to be notified of upcoming events. Um, next month on May 20th, um, Katrina Dobson and Heather Cleary will be discussing how translators build their own constantly evolving philosophies of translation. The registration link is in the chat and on the Center for Fiction's website. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you everyone, goodbye, stay safe.